Hello, friends and family. Welcome back to the Sober's Dope Podcast. Today, we have a very exciting guest, Keola Reigns. And Keola is a kinesiologist, nutrition coach, and recovery coach. I'm going to read a brief bio, and we're going to get into this amazing episode full of impactful knowledge on how you could transform your health, your mind, body, and your recovery process. If you're a person that's dealing with addiction, whether it's food addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs, this episode is for you. Keola Reigns is a precision nutrition certified coach and a National Academy of Sports Medicine certified trainer. She received her BS in kinesiology at CSU Fullerton and her MS in exercise psychology at CSU Long Beach. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so honored to share this amazing episode with you. Please share it with your friends. If you want to level up your health, your mind, body connection, this episode is for you. With no further ado, we're going to bring Keola Reigns in on the Sober's Dope podcast. Hang in. Ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, welcome to the Sober's Dope podcast. I'm your host, Pop Buchanan, and I am extremely, extremely excited today to have a really special guest. I wanted this person to be on a podcast for quite some time and we finally made the time to make it happen and it's always beautiful to connect with great people we have the wonderful keola reigns today and she's a wellness geek coach speaker and facilitator in the recovery space her philosophy is to educate empower and impact and she has so much going on she has a bachelor's in kinesiology and a master's in exercise psychology and her intention is for her clients to gain confidence in nutrition. And she is, in addition to that, a precision nutrition certified coach and a National Academy of Sports Medicine certified trainer. Keola, welcome to the Sober is Dope podcast. <laughs> All that stuff. I, I got to add one more. I just finished a peer support specialist uh, credential, which is a California state credential. So adding more always... <laughs> continuing the education because right. we need to constantly be learning, especially in this recovery space that's evolving every single day. So I'm very excited to be here and uh, yeah, let's get, let's get into it. Well, first thing I want to talk about is before we get into your recovery, can you talk to us about what's kinetic wellness and the whole philosophy behind that? Yeah. So energy in motion. Um, as a kinesiology major, I I got drawn to that kinetic energy, which is energy in motion. It is the opposite of potential energy, right? So we hear about people who you have so much potential and that's great, but it means nothing unless you put it into action. And so I like to teach folks how to take their energy and take action through effective goal setting and not only setting the goals, but taking the actions, breaking it down step by step. What do I need to do? What moves do I need to make today in order to be able to live the life that I'm imagining, that I'm dreaming for myself or the life that I that I want to live? It's all about action, action, and more action. I love that. I love that. That brings me to, uh, I remember my friend Katie Bowman, I was reading uh, all her stuff uh, a couple of years ago, and she was talking about all movement matters. And then she was talking about move your DNA. So it was like, you have to actually get out, move, use your body to actually activate your DNA, actually move the nutrition. I like to tell people after you eat a meal, it's ideal to go walking or do some type of movement so the nutrients could get to where they need to get to. So I, I love that. I love yeah. that. I want to um for so this is a a subject that's really popular to people because it's rarely touched on in the recovery community and that's our brain in recovery our dopamine receptors our dopamine and how to kind of repair your dopamine receptors after a life of you misuse whether it's alcohol or drugs right so can we talk a little bit about some tips for people that may be new in recovery or so that was hitting the bottle hard? Like me, I was drinking for like 20 years before I quit. Um, and when I did, I had to really focus on a combination between meditation, sleep and nutrition to actually start to feel normal again. Can we talk a little bit about the brain and recovery and health overall? Yeah, definitely. So 
One of the things that we can use food for is to be a new way to deliver dopamine. If we were abusing a substance, our brains were getting an abundance or a flood of signals. And so once we stop using that substance, our brain is still looking for that signal for that chemical messenger. Not only dopamine, but serotonin, GABA, all of those chemical messengers become affected negatively when we're abusing a substance. And so when we are in the space to repair and heal, one of the best ways to support that is through movement but also using proper nutrition. And it's not only the brain that we need to heal, the brain in our skull, but what's called our second brain, more recently being called our second brain, which is our gut. And our gut is releasing hormones, which is another chemical messenger. Our brain is releasing neurotransmitters, which is a chemical messenger. So both of those are operating in a similar way, telling our body how to function and how to feel. So my first suggestion when it comes to the healing part, one of the healing parts of recovery is getting tapped in with a nutritionist, a nutrition coach, or a registered dietitian. Um, one of those three, and for using myself as an example, my certification is created by registered dietitian. So registered dietitian is the top of the top of the food chain, pun intended, I guess. They're the top of the food chain. Nutritionists are, are right underneath a registered dietitian or right along with, and then a nutrition coach is the person who is on the ground doing the person to person coaching. And so get dialed in in that aspect so that you can have a nutrition plan that's customized for you and your recovery journey, your body, your goals that is designed to help support brain health and support gut health. Because if we were getting an, an abundance, you know, a flood of dopamine and other chemical messengers, depending on what substance it was, where your mood is now negatively affected and your digestion is now negatively affected, those are all going to play a role in your experiences in your recovery. We have to be mindful about decreasing our screen time um, because we're trying to balance out how our body receives that message, that dopamine message. So we need to be very mindful about who we put ourselves around, those people, places, and things being overloaded with too much information. So there's a lot to it when it comes to healing the brain, but I want to drive home that message that it's not just the brain that's in your head, it's your second brain, which is also your gut. So both of those are going to be positively impacted by a really mindful nutrition program. I love that. I love that. We talk about the gut a lot on the Sober is Dope pod podcast, the importance of the gut microbiome, um, epigenetic responses to your gut health and how that affects your overall genetic environment and your your whole body. I try so to break it to make it more simple for people, we want to bring it home, everyone, that your gut is one of the most important things right now in 2022 and 2023 you need to focus on your gut health it's responsible for you it takes care of your whole put it this way your gut bacteria was here before everything it was part of the primordial stew of this planet and your gut bacteria and bacteria is going to be here when we're gone and it makes up pretty much everything about us so a lot of our genetic building blocks is on our bacteria when your bacteria is not healthy, you have a bunch of bad bacteria or bad, what they call gut bu bugs that kind of disrupt your environment. And that's when you have all of these hormonal disruptors where you want to eat pizza all day instead of broccoli because you're putting all of this junk into your body. Could we just talk about a little bit about any tips, food tips, or any little micro bits you could give to someone on a basic level on how they could begin to heal their gut? Because a lot of us are walking around with really bad gut health. Yes. I am the type of coach that doesn't ever want to take anything from you. I want to give. Okay. So okay. my suggestion will be if you know that your diet is not very nutrient dense because you're eating fast food, you're eating top ramen, you're eating whatever leftovers somebody's just handing down to you. The best thing you can do is start with adding in raw vegetables somewhere in there, adding in raw vegetables. So if you can get a few servings, I'll give you a really simple 
way of measuring one serving. You take your hand, everybody's hand is different. You take your hand and think of a cupped hand. So if you scooped up or grabbed a handful or a cupped handful of broccoli, carrots, asparagus, um, artichokes, if you grab something like a, even pickles technically, because those are uh, fermented foods, asparagus, beets, get yourself a few servings. And if the things I listed are not your favorite vegetables, any vegetable will work to get us started. Okay. So that's the first simple tip is by adding in a few servings. Now we're five a day is the number that was kind of thrown around by the USDA, but there's, there's just about no limit, right? You can almost not have too many vegetables. So start by adding that in. So if you're doing the burger and fries, do yourself the favor and order a salad off the menu as well. Start adding in those raw vegetables multiple times a day. Now, somebody out there is saying, I can't stand the taste of vegetables. I don't know what to do or I don't like raw vegetables. Okay, lightly steamed or blanched. I still don't like vegetables. I don't want to eat vegetables. Fine. Add them into a smoothie then. I have a really great recipe. Uh, you will not taste this at whatsoever. Um, beets. Chocolate protein powder. So beets, you can get pickled beets. You can you can get beets and steam them or boil them. Chocolate protein powder and frozen berries. You will not taste a single beet in there. You're getting support for not only your um, overall nutrient density in your day, but beets are really good for liver support. Now you're getting in protein. Now you have some berries in there, which are antioxidants. We're getting the vegetables in for fiber. So it's a simple way to get more veggies in is put it into a protein drink or a smoothie if you're not a big fan of eating vegetables. I'll give you one more recipe that hides um, carrots. So a handful of baby carrots, frozen mangoes, a little bit, a couple frozen pineapples, vanilla protein powder, add some water. There you go. You can't taste the carrots. All you taste is the mango and the pineapple. And now you're getting in also more nutrients, more fiber. So I'm going to find a way to help people add in those vegetables. But simple, simple first step is adding in raw veggies. Start there before we even talk about taking something out of your out of your uh, meal plan or your diet. I love that. I love that a lot because you know that it's a little hack in there. As you start adding in, your gut bacteria starts to change and you'll start craving a little bit more of the good stuff and eventually hopefully balance hopefully it balances out. <laughs> uh man. I love that beets has a lot of nitric oxide also. So for you for you guys out there, that might be a natural way to stay virile and strong and um and, and also for energy, the nitric oxide. Um, so my, my protein shake is wild, right? So here we go. I, I have a mix of a bunch of stuff. This is kind of like, but I just started this about seven months ago because I'm on a diet now. Not diet. My lifestyle shifted. I said enough is enough, especially being a young black man in America. I don't want to be a statistic. I didn't want to deal with diabetes. I didn't want to deal with any of that junk. The whole platform of me being online, so you know, it's so it's dope, started with my monk healing page. And it was when I went into the doctor about six years ago, the doctor told me I was pre-diabetic. Mm. And I knew all of this stuff about nutrition, but was just goofing off, right? I was upset because my grandmother had no toes. I remember seeing my grand my grandmother with no toes, beautiful woman, almost six five, six five. This lady was a giant. And I used to say, Grandma, what happened to your toes? And I used to say, the sugar, the sugar. And I could not make the connection in my young mind. I'm like, the sugar? What? So the sugar that went. So I started thinking about it. Then when they told me I was pre-diabetic, I said, oh, no, no. I said, I'll be back in three months because we know they could only, they could draw your blood A1C every three months. Mm -hmm. So I told my doctor, I said, in three months, I'm going to reverse this. And they was like, what? They was like, I was like, I'll show, I promise you, I'm going to come back in three months. Cause I know you can't give me no nutrition or advice. I knew that my doctor, they, we know that. So I said, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go do, and I did, I went on a ketogenic diet at the time just to reduce the carbs and the blood sugar. Then I transitioned into plant-based keto kind of, anyway, I came back in three months and my blood A1C went down to a healthy level it was outside the pre-diabetic range. And, um, and then since then I started thinking about, okay, this is serious. And I, 
fast forward to now, I literally just like about seven months ago was just somehow depressed, going through a lot. I had this issue with my nose, which I think was an autoimmunity after I told you I got sick, where I became um, chemically sensitive to anything in my environment. So I couldn't take any smell, shampoos, and and um, that's a whole nother subject about the toxicity in our shampoos, our soaps, the air fresheners, the en- the endocrine disruptor. This stuff is toxic, right? So now I still my whole environment is pure. I have to use like everything is scent free, and I feel better. But um, I say all of that. So I went back to my doctor recently after that, and they say you're pre diabetic again. And that's when I decided that this is non negotiable. These are non negotiables now, right? With our health. I'm 43. So I said to myself, well, my dad died at 42 of a heart attack. Um, My grandfather had Alzheimer's and diabetes. My grandmother died of lung disease. I mean, come on. So I just changed everything. I made a decision. And what I'm about to say may help a lot of people. I decided to treat my nutrition like I treat my recovery one day at a time. And I cannot play games. Like I cannot have an alcoholic beverage or I will turn into a Tasmanian devil. (laughs) And I have to treat my recovery the same way. I think we give ourselves leeway and that leeway is where the devil lie within our nutritional health, especially I want to say this for my African black descent brothers and sisters. And I, we know that because the standard American diet really disagrees with us. We have no protection from it. It just, it destroys us because, um, you know, and when we was in Africa, we was eating from the land and vegetables and we was pretty much plant based. And we had to really go through a lot to get the we w- it wasn't a really heavy protein based diet. And not to mention what pissed me off is when I read the China study, which was part the, the China study also was based in the Ga- Ga- Ghana. And they were showing that there was evidence that Africans had no um, history of heart disease. They had no history of dental decay. They had no history of um, diabetes. It had no, none of that. It was non-existent, the common cold, all of that. We, it wasn't even, they studied this. And that's when they realized that when they studied the blue zones and all of this, that there's a way you can live where you increase your longevity and your health and lifespan, right? And um, I say all of this to say for me, um, Keola, that um, you're talking to someone that, and maybe we could do a lot together where I take this really seriously. Um, so going back to my smoothie to bring it full circle, I, I have, um, I do chia seeds, sprouted chia seeds, Check. Um, dark chocolate, dark um, chocolate powder, because that's heavy antioxidant. I mm-hmm. also do um, oats, um, wrote, um, oats, uh, raw oats, uh, just a sprinkle because the car, I'm carb sensitive, but that's for my gut bacteria. Uh, I do blueberries because of the low sugar content, because also because I'm pre diet have that sensitivity. And, um, and I, I use an almond or oat milk base, which I'm still trying to find a better base, but I don't do dairy milk. Water. Water. Okay. Water, water, Uh, water, however you want to say it, get that oat milk out of there. Get it out of there. Get it out of there. It's just a, I love it. This is my my thoughts on it i want to hear it let's go water we can't argue that we need more water we we cannot say that we need more oat milk or we need more Um, almond almond. milk and and yeah the, the thing is that when you look at the nutrients on almond milk, it's mostly carbs. Now you're adding in carbs where mm-hmm. if you're using rolled oats or eating oatmeal, which I would suggest, highly suggest for cholesterol and also to deliver neurotransmitters to the system, you have the oats in there already. Now, we know that there's no – nuts don't make milk and oats don't make milk. Correct. Only, correct. you know, mammals can right. make milk. And so we – are, we're adding in very low efficient nutrients. That's what I'll say. Mm. That's what I'll say. If you're already adding in all this nutrition with the chia seeds and the dark chocolate and the blueberries and right. maybe a handful of spinach, right? Water, water, ice cold water. The nut milk and the oat milk. Get it out. All right, it does. See, you learn that. something every day. Thank you. Thank and I'm you. Saving, I'm, I'm saving you room for something more nutrient dense. The macro right. profile on um, almond milk 
the protein is maybe six grams and I could be mistaken, but it's, it's less than 10. It's very low protein yes. and the carbs are depending on if you get sweetened or unsweetened, unsweetened, flavored, unsweetened. Flavored, the carbs are lower, but it's just an, it's an extra 50 or 60 calories that doesn't have enough nutrition where you could fit something else in later on in your day. I love that. that. So you're talking about nutritional trade-offs, like make sure you're, that's brilliant. I, thank you very much. I love it. I that's love the new that. thing. You heard it here first. Right, right. Hey. So he is <laughs> done with the oat milk and the almond uh, milk and the shake. He's yes. placing it with ice cold water. Ice cold water. I love it. I love it. All right. So, um, Fasting. Can you talk to us about benefits of fasting and do you recommend it or is it a fad and is there no scientific basis for it? Oh, there's so much scientific basis for it. Um, and you're going to hear from people on both parties, right? I have a, a colleague who is an OBGYN. She, her Instagram is the fasting doctor, I think is her, her Instagram page. She is all for fasting. She teaches it for women who are having fertility challenges. Mm -hmm. um, and her lifestyle is a fasting lifestyle. There are other doctors who do not recommend it. And although there is research that supports autophagy or autophagy, which means your cells get to do a cleanup on their own, which we we need them to do that. Um, now, that can happen in a longer eating window. The impact is more when you're in a shorter eating window. But if we can be mindful of giving ourselves at least 12 hours, that's a good place to start. So if your first meal is at 7, then 7 p.m. is, is your last meal. And to get even more specific with that, your last meal is two hours before you go to sleep. Okay. So I, for myself, love a fasting regimen. I tend to not be extremely hungry when I first wake up. However, I'm also a certified nutrition coach with 15 years of experience with playing with food, right? So testing out different nutrition programs to see how they make me feel and um, working with clients with different nutrition programs and seeing their results. And so I say that because it's important how we look at our clients through precision is, are they level one, level two, level three? If I'm working with a world-class athlete who takes 25 different supplements a day, has a chef, trains multiple hours a day, I'm going to give them a different regimen and protocol than the person who is coming in with prediabetes, has never followed a nutrition program, and they don't know what a macronutrient is. I'm not going to say, let's jump into intermittent fasting. Oh, and you just got sober too? No, no, no. We're going to start with adding in the raw vegetables. And maybe later on, 90 days down the line, we'll talk about nutrient timing. But what you get from fasting, besides the physical benefits of allowing your cells to repair and rebuild themselves without having all of this extra information to process, and I say information because I want people to start thinking about food as data more than food as fuel. You're a computer versus a car, right? So we are supercomputers. And when you want a computer to do something, you have to put data in. That's what food is. If you take a chemistry class or a, a nutrition science class, you'll learn every single thing that we are eating is has a chemical makeup to it. Which side note, when people say, don't eat food if you don't eat anything if you can't pronounce the ingredients, don't follow that rule of thumb. Because if you break down a banana it has a chemical compound that you might not be able to pronounce either. So we don't want to just break it down to that simple. If you can't pronounce it, don't eat it. Back to fasting. So you get the benefit of autophagy or autophagy. It's pronounced different ways. Your cells getting to repair and rebuild themselves without having to process this new information that you keep consuming um, 16 hours a day. So if you start with the 12 hour point, you can get some benefit there for digestion. And then if you are interested in closing that window, something like an eight hour eating window or a six hour eating window, I would say that's something to work with a coach or um, a dietitian or a nutritionist so that they can look at what's happening to your body. Um, you want to be mindful about your personal schedule because let's be real, if you get up at 5 a.m. every day and you work out in the morning, chances are you're going to need some information, some data in your system sooner than one o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And also I want people to know fasting does not 
just mean skipping breakfast. That's not what the intermittent fasting means. You choose your window. Some people will get up early and they want to eat breakfast within 30 minutes to an hour. Awesome. That person could have a great fasting window where they stop eating earlier in the evening and their fast starts around maybe four or five o'clock. They go to bed at eight o'clock or nine o'clock. And that would be like an ideal healthy routine. Um, And I say healthy like in quotes, that'd be an ideal routine for someone with that schedule. But you have, you can play around with it. Um, You can use seasons to change the way you eat. I know for myself in the summer, we're ripping and running. (laughs) We're, We're just out and about. We're on the go. We're very active. And so I'm more likely to get up and want to start having some information and nutrition right away because I have a really long day. When the time changes and the sun goes down earlier, I'm moving a little bit less. We have less activities. And so I might be able to wait a little longer in the morning to have my first meal. So it doesn't have to be set in stone. You can play around with it. But I I do not suggest a fasting schedule for someone at the beginning of their recovery journey. I also don't suggest at the beginning of your recovery journey an intense change in your nutrition program. I suggest small additions, adding in the things that are extremely beneficial, starting with adding in things first, and then we start looking at changing what it is that you're eating and changing your eating schedule. So huge fan of fasting. Plenty of research to support the benefits of it, but there's no one size fits all as to everyone should fast or it not being good for everyone. So you you get to decide what works for you. I love that. I love that. Um, there's a researcher by the name of Dr. Walter Longo who talks a lot about fasting and he has this um, system he invented called the fasting mimicking diet. Um mm. Like and so the theory was that uh, I, I from if I remember correctly, plant based like going extremely plant based or almost raw is actually your body treats it as if you're fasting. Is that true, or is there any scientific basis there? That I'm not sure of. If I, are you talking about the prolong? Is it prolong diet? Because I've seen ads for this fasting mimicking. Well, he's a program. he's one of the main researchers that study like the benefits of fasting and autophagy and everything. And he has this kind of like system of nutrition that you could purchase through him, but when you do the research it's like like light soup, maybe right. some vegetables for some people. And then he was talking about like some of the yogis of India and stuff who fast, they're not necessarily they fast, but that that their idea of fasting is cutting out mainly foods and just eating vegetables that's what they consider like a light form of fasting for someone who wants to ease into more of a hardcore fast yes i see so i can't speak on if that's true or not but i can tell you that one thing that we all will benefit from is more raw fruits and vegetables in our nutrition plan and so if you are doing something where it's lightly steamed and you're turning that into a puree, having a soup or something like that. That reminds me of an Ayurveda or Ayurvedic yes. diet or nutrition program um, that's gentle on the stomach because, again, the less we have to break down, right. the faster those nutrients are delivered to the system. So our body recognizes, oh, that's an apple right away. That's an apple that's a banana, that's a beet, that is broccoli, or that's, you know, cherries or whatever, right away. Same thing with things like um, rice, which people think are, we should never eat. And and that's just not true. Um, Or beans, our body recognizes those things really quickly and easily. When we start adding in additives and sugar and these man-made ingredients, that's when it takes a little bit longer for your body to recognize that data. It's like, oh, what is this? This is not one of the original, you know, inputs that was in my system. When you get a computer, it has some programming in there already. When you start adding in or your phone, every time you download a new app, that throws something off. So we think, again, our food as information, we want to give it the most powerful, potent, effective information possible. And so if you're not ready to not eat for 72 hours, or you're not ready to eat only between the hours of one o'clock and four o'clock, 
then giving yourself whole foods or foods in their most whole form, you are going to benefit your system in ease of digestion. I love that. I love that. So you, as you could tell, I just love picking your brain. It's wonderful. Um, what recently um, someone close to me um, came into a, like a health scare and, and then I started researching, like going deeper into the dangers of alcohol. And when you studying things like cancer and all of these other things, you see at the top, you got to cut out alcohol. Like, alcohol causes a lot of problems in the body. So being that it's a sober podcast, I kind of want to drive home sometime to people the other side of the dangers of drinking besides the mental aspect and the whole phys- like just uh, the actual what it does to your body, the, f- the cancer causing effects, the fact that it's a carcinogen and stuff like that. Could we talk about alcohol and the health dangers of just drinking in general for both men, women, breast cancer related and all these other things? Well, there's nothing beneficial. (laughs) I mean, we just go straight to the point. There's nothing beneficial about alcohol when it comes to your body, your brain, um, your physiology. It's not enhancing anything in, in any way where there are some other substances where even a physician could argue and say, well, we use this in this way prescribed for this person and it helps with these organs or it adds benefit. Alcohol doesn't have that unless it's the civil war and you just got your leg chopped off and we don't have anesthesia and we have, you know, we're using it that way. But if you think about it, if you, if you're looking at the substance that at one point was used to knock people out so they could get their leg cut off, why do you want to sip on that for fun? We know, we know that it's poison. So besides knowing that it's poison and that it doesn't have any health benefits, We also, because I want to bring everything back to nutrition, digestion, health, we also know that our body has to stop processing and breaking down other nutrients when alcohol enters the system. Wow. So let's just say you had that bomb, delicious smoothie, you worked out, you were fasting, you took all your supplements, you're just doing the most. You eat raw, you're doing it. As soon as you take a drink, it's pause on processing all of those amazing things you just put into your body so that your body can get the alcohol out. Now imagine you do not have a nutrient dense diet. Imagine you do not exercise. You do not have a calm, peaceful environment. Your body's already at a stress level and now you're adding in a little bit of poison right on top, actual poison. And so it has to stop processing the low nutrient density food that you were eating and come back to that later. So when our body's not processing fat and carbohydrates, they get stored for later. Now, let's say you do the same thing again tomorrow. You don't exercise, you have a high stress job, you have a low nutrient dense nutrition program and you drink again. Now you have some storage left over from yesterday of nutrients that were not used. And again, you put alcohol in the system. Now we got two days worth of storage of low use nutrients, meaning when I say low use, meaning you're not using them because you're not exercising. And now those get stored again as fat. And we're piling this on weekend after weekend as we binge drink or evening after evening as we have what we think, well, it's just two glasses of wine, but you did two glasses of wine 30 days straight, ma'am. That's 60 glasses of wine and you don't exercise. So what are we really doing to our bodies? We have to remember there is no health benefit. This is not my opinion. American Cancer Society says no amount of alcohol is healthy. No amount of alcohol is healthy. We're not it's not a secret anymore. We used to think well a glass of wine is good for the heart. No. No. We no. Realize that it's not it's not the wine that's good for the heart. It's the resveratrol that's good for the heart which you can get from grapes. Right. So grapes are good for the heart. Blueberries with antioxidants, raspberries with antioxidants, those are good for the system. As soon as you ferment those and let it turn into alcohol, now we lose the health benefit. I love it. That's just shattering the myth for everyone who tries to... I don't know who put that myth out there, but that got it killed so many people with that wine is healthy because of the reverberatrol. And, and we know that the health benefits diminish the moment it turns to alcohol. I'm glad you confirmed that for us today. Um, 
So on your personal journey, can you talk to us about your personal relationship and recovery and what that looked like? I'm not sure if you had any addiction issues or if you're just a coach for people in recovery. Can you clarify and give us a little background on your relationship and your story? I am definitely a lived experience person. Um, I was drinking. I was partying. I was, I'll dabble. I'll try it. If you have it, let's see what happens. I decided around, I would say eight or nine years old that I want to, I want to get high. And that is because my dad was struggling with addiction. And so that thought came to me after one of the weekends that he had been gone for a few days and asking my mom, where is he? Where is he? I just thought, he must be doing something real fun because he's not coming home. So it must be a good time. Now that's an eight or nine year old not realizing the terror and the nightmare that addiction is. It wasn't fun. He wasn't having fun. He didn't want to be there. His body was making him do these things. His brain, his mind, the addiction was making him be there. So the naive mind of mine had this curiosity and family parties, right? Christmas, everybody looks like they're having a good time. Family looks like they're having fun. And I see my grandfather's pouring wine. They, it, again, I make this connection. It must be fun. It must be fun. So as soon as I had a chance to get my hands on a drink at 15, it was like off and running. Whenever I could access it, which was not at home, because once my dad got sober, you know, it was a very strict Bible-based household. He he threw himself into the church. That's really where his recovery is rooted. And so a little bit of rebellion mixed with curiosity and maybe my DNA makeup. I don't I don't know if that's the case for me, but I just found comfort in alcohol. It it brought down the anxiety, which I didn't realize at that time is what I was dealing with. It gave me that tool to feel cool, to fit in. My personality is whatever I'm doing, I'm going 100%. So I became a bartender, which was, you know, getting high on my own supply. I have access to whatever I want now. And that was a a 20 year, yeah, 21 year relationship with alcohol that I had. I knew um, 2008 was one of the first like, well, you're not drinking like everybody else because I, I actually woke up to a missed alarm and missed text messages from fitness clients because I had blacked out and just missed the whole morning of work. And so that was the the first teary eyed shit. I don't like what, it, what is going on? Like, how did I miss work? This is, this is too much. Yes. So I'll just, I'll cut back a little. I'll just cut back. I, I won't drink so much. I'll only drink on these days and I'll only drink with these people. And that started again, 10 years of those rules and those regulations. And well, I'm getting a master's degree. So it's not that bad because there's no alcoholics with master's degrees, right? This is what my uninformed self was thinking. 2015, uh, I got a DUI. I had been out partying all night long, decided to drive home, drove my car off the side of a freeway and luck, lucky to be alive. And that's one thing that I say, I don't regret much in my life, but the times that I drank and drove, those are the times that I, if I could go back and take things back, that would be it because other people could have lost their lives because of me. And that's not cool. That's just not, you know, that's the one thing that I'm like, there's a lot of, I don't regret, but that's the thing I would take back because it's just so selfish. And so after that DUI, slap on the wrist, scared straight, still, still thought it's not that bad that I got caught that one time. I'll never do that again. Went to an AA meeting, one AA meeting. And I was like, no, I'm not like these people. They have a real problem. I made one mistake. I lasted about eight months at that time. I didn't get into fellowship. I didn't get a sponsor. I didn't go back to any, any meetings. I just tried to do it all on my own. Still hung out with the same people, still stayed in the same environment. I say black knuckling it because they say white knuckle, but I don't have white knuckles. So I was black knuckling. I was black knuckling it. (laughs) And, um, you know, temptation just said, you can have just one. It's fine. That led to another few years of drinking. And then just finally being sick of it, being sick and tired of it. Just I got to that point. And I think that it's, it's very true. 
you are not going to recover until you're ready to recover. And I'm grateful because a lot of people are not ever going to be ready. So I take it very seriously that the light bulb went on for me, the aha moment, the whatever it was, moment of clarity, whatever it was that happened, I'm grateful that it happened for me. And I had no plan on becoming a sober coach. That's not what I thought. I thought I'm going to get sober so I can get back into the fitness thing. I can get my business going again. I'm doing this for me. And it turned out, you know, higher power, God, what had a different plan for me is like use all of this education that you were using for the general population, people in recovery need to know about movement. People in recovery need to know about nutrition and how to use these tools to support their sobriety. And so January 1st, 2019, I walked into a meeting again. I said, all right, I'm just like you guys. <laughs> I've accepted I'm just like y'all. I heard shares and I'm like, yep, I'm just like that lady, just like that guy. And I humbled myself and I surrendered to the help that was there for me. And since then I've expanded into other spaces. I will always have respect for the 12 step program. The way that I learn, you just give me some directions to follow. I'm gonna follow the directions and, and things click for me. And so while I'm not an active part of that membership, I think I will whatever people want to do, just like nutrition, I'm a sobriety agnostic. So if you want to try 12 step, I'll support you in 12 step. If you want to try smart recovery, I'll support you in that. Whatever program you want to follow, just like whatever nutrition plan you want to follow, let's work it. Let's do it. Cause they all work. All of them work. Keto works, whole 30 works, paleo. They all work for a certain person with a certain lifestyle. Um, and it did, it, it turned into, yeah, very quickly in the last three years, it just turned into opportunities to speak and share. And I'm, I'm not shy. I'm also not ashamed. And that's what got me connected in the social the social media world of sobriety is because I immediately posted that 24 hour chip and I was like, this is what I'm doing. I know I'm not staying anonymous, but I can't stay anonymous because somebody needs to know that I'm doing this. And the only reason I had the courage to go into a, a 12 step room was because somebody I went to high school with posted their three year chip on Instagram. And I was like, no way, not, not him. <laughs> not him, you know? So I was like, well, you know what? There you go. Anybody, this could happen to anybody. And that inspired me, What you know, one of the pieces to start my journey. And it's been three years since I've had a drink. The first year had a couple ups and downs. and But I still count that year because I was actively in recovery. I still, it's still a year of me doing work, therapy, meetings, being in fellowship. And I consciously chose to drink a couple of times and I never gave up the, I never gave up the journey. So four years in recovery, three years alcohol free. I, I don't see, I just don't see it as a part of my life. I don't, I, there's, there's no allure to, for me anymore. Um, once you know all of the damage it can do, it's like, why would I even think about, you know, risking it? I, it's, it's not for me. So. I'm very grateful. Very, I, I hope that people will find their their reason why, or their aha moment, or the light bulb goes off, or whatever. I just, I hope that somebody finds that even today, listening to this message, whatever it takes. Like you deserve recovery. You deserve it. Oh man! Well, congratulations on your recovery journeys. It's such a beautiful reality when you cross over, and I'm looking at you, hearing you, and you you have so much to give to the world. God, you know, you have this anointing on you. I see it. I feel it. And I just that's what alcohol and drugs steal. They take amazing people and they just break them down into lower vibrations. And it's just you don't want to see a, a perfect creation you know, tarnish in that way. So congratulations and keep doing the good work. Um, on, on Sober's Dope, we put a huge emphasis on comorbidity, comorbid addiction, and that relationship between mental health mm -hmm. and addiction, treat, treating them both either simultaneously or around the same time. So you have this whole approach to healing. Um, do you have any history or is there any mental health aspects, whether anxiety or anything that kind of fueled the addiction or is that does 
anything that you think relates? Yeah, definitely. So I didn't know that I um, had anxiety. I just, I thought I was an overthinker. I thought I was a worrier. And because I, I wasn't given access to therapy or counseling as a, a kid or, you know, even coming from a household where a parent was dealing with addiction, I I just thought that was, it's just the way it is, Keola. You just overthink and, you know, you just got to learn how to not overthink. Only recently, so in the last two years, did I get the general anxiety disorder diagnosis. And so once I finally understood this is a real, this is not just, oh girl, you just think too much. No, there's something happening in my system that is heightened, that is more alert, more aware. And then doing the work in therapy, looking at childhood trauma and the upbringing that I came up with, there was a lot of unsurety and chaos. And, you know, when some, when you don't know if your dad's coming home every other week, you're on alert, it's, you know, and then that's in your system that there's uh the body keeps the score right so we hold on to stuff and so not until you know adulthood did i learn what was actually going on and then i said oh that's why i was drinking okay it became my medicine not even realizing that that's what i was trying to quiet or that's why it felt so like oh my god it felt like a relief so I've worked with therapists to learn coping tools and skills on how to live with anxiety because it's not for me something that um I would say like it's a, a cure. I think that we learn how to face these things. We learn how to face our trauma. We learn how to face the anxiety, face the depression and say I see you. I see how you're moving. I see that in this season, you kind of creep in. So what I'm going to do is stay active, stay connected. I'm going to learn how to um, see depression when it starts to creep in. I'm going to learn how to see anxiety when it starts to creep in. And I'm going to use, again, because research is showing that we can use food to help live with anxiety and live with depression. We can help use food to improve brain health and gut health. And if those two are on point, then our brain is giving neurotransmitters, our gut is giving hormones, and everything can balance in the way that it needs to. Exercise and food are two of the best ways to help improve and maintain our mental health. And once I started getting all these pieces clicking, I said, oh, okay, I can live with anxiety. And I can also live alcohol-free with anxiety. So now I'm I'm just moving on up the scale of healing. I'm not afraid of overthinking. I can identify it and say, okay, I see what's going on. Take a break, put the pen down, catch your breath, remember you're right here right now, and use tools to to cope with it and live with it. I very much believe in myself as an overcomer. Um, I find power in, in saying I live with anxiety versus I struggle with anxiety because it's I'm not struggling. I'm living with it. I'm powering through this. It, it's, it doesn't hold me back anymore because I'm not using the wrong medicine to work with it. I'm using nutrition and movement. And what's really big for me is fellowship, staying connected in fellowship. So I know I'm not the only person. I've talked to like 100 people a hundred people three days a week that also have anxiety, that also have depression, that also have different mental health challenges. And we move through it together. So I, I in my experience, I'm willing to bet, I don't know a hundred percent, but I'm willing to bet at least half of the people, at least half of the people who have alcohol use or substance use disorder also have a mental health challenge that they're moving through. Absolutely. I don't know Absolutely. the stats on that, but I, but you, is it? It's definitely a serious, is a serious amount of people because you can't put, put it this way. Alcohol is a depressant. It depresses your nervous system. So it intrinsically has a mental health component because at yeah. some point you're going to hit the anxiety wall. You're going to hit that depression and your mood is going to drop and those vital neurotransmitter hormones are, are going to be affected. And the fact that it affects your dopamine receptors to the point to where you're looking for it and it's robbing you of dopamine, it's automatically should be classified as a mental health um, issue 
yeah. automatically. So you can't remove the two. And I don't care if science catches up. Science is going to use us as case studies to prove what we're talking about. So yeah. um, I know it from firsthand experience. The day I stopped drinking, my brain started to heal. You know, I remember um, days where I would leave my house after a night of drinking and a penny would fall out of my pocket and they'll hit the ground and my whole nervous system will rattle. Like, I'm just like, whoa, I see a car. I'm not, I'm not even fit to be in society. I can't even walk. And I'm like smoking a cigarette, shaking. And I'm like, you got to you, you, you're a mess, <laughs> you know. So um, it, it was important. And I, I took I, I went to therapy. I took a psych social, uh, bio psych social. Yeah. I was diagnosed with um um stay i don't know how she died she said i was um, I, I guess it was depression they just mm -hmm. said my mood a normal person's state of happiness was like here and i was all the way down here but okay. because i was visibly manic in a way like excited and happy they was mm -hmm. like but you're just walking around sad and we got to fix it so they gave me well butrin to help repair my serotonin um levels and as i did that for a year and then I, I was good to go. Um, yeah. One thing I tell people is I sober is dope. And, the whole you know, my whole philosophy is the all in approach. Right. I was doing meditation. I was using prayer. I was doing actual meditation. I was going to therapy. I was taking medication. I was working out, exercising. I was working on my diet. I was repairing connection with people. I was yeah. going to 12 steps. Right. I was doing all of this at the same time. This was part of my treatment. And I don't think everyone had the liberty. I hit rock bottom so bad that I was like literally I lost everything I had 1.5 million dollar house everything and then I went into the street and about three days of me doing that I was like I can't I gotta I gotta figure it out I can't do the homeless panhandling I just I was like nah I'm not built for that yeah. but thank god I had the sense and then that's what started me going through I had the liberty to really test this out my whole day a successful day for me was from nine to five did you go to group did right. you go see a psychiatrist? Did you go to the gym? And that all in approach for me helps me to stay grounded. And like you, I don't have to go to AA every day now. I'm at a sp space where I know if I'm triggered or in trouble, I have yeah. to seek fellowship. But between everything that I'm doing, um, I'm able to keep it together. So speaking to you was so fun today. We could keep going. I swear I, I could talk to you for 12 hours straight. Um <laughs> Thank you for sharing your recovery journey. I would like for you to be somewhat like our resident kind of like nutritional kind of recovery oh, person. Oh, so, I love that. Yeah, you could come on every three months or something and give us some yes. updates with you. Um, to everyone out there that's listening, Keola is an exceptional coach in both health, um, kinesiology, movement, body, nutrition, and recovery. So in closing... You have the floor. Can you tell our community where they could find you, where they could look out for your services, how they could get into your groups and the female group and everything, and then um, where they could find you online? Thank you. Yes, all of that good stuff. Okay, so I am coaching on an app called Reframe. Reframe is a quitting alcohol app. I lead meetings there three days a week. Um, so you download that app, check me out on Reframe. I am also the host on sober black women. So if you are a black woman or a sober curious black woman, um, please find me on clubhouse at Keola Reigns. You're welcome to follow me on Instagram, which my Instagram page is just for fun. I don't do any coaching there, but I share, that's where I share the geeky wellness stuff that I believe in. So my Instagram is also my name at Keola Reigns. If you're interested in booking a discovery call with me, you can find the link for that on my website, keolareigns.com. So I'm very excited to be able to share with anybody who's looking for support in their journey um, by using movement and nutrition to make your foundation very, very solid and very, very strong. And um, I want to come back and talk about the importance of safe spaces for people of color in sobriety. Yes, so yes, yes. We should talk about that. Uh, yes, <laughs> exactly. And um, and I will also love to talk about um, how we could, you know, strengthen the community so we have a bigger presence. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family, that's a wrap for our amazing episode with Keola Rays. This is the Sober is Dope podcast. I love you all. Go in peace and we'll catch you on the other side.